Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And actually, two big notes before we get started. One, after today's show, you should definitely check out my brand new podcast with Joey Graceffa. That, of course, the Conversation With podcast, which I actually uploaded to YouTube just before this video. You can check it out at youtube.com slash a convo with or just link down below. And two, I would like to acknowledge yesterday's massive mistake around this. I pronounce this Dazen, and those of you in the comments section who were just, who were able to use your fingers after you cringe so hard that really it almost put you in the hospital, you informed me that it's actually pronounced Dazones. I would like to, one, acknowledge my mistake, but also two, say expecting people to know that that's Dazone is fucking stupid. Okay, yeah, the first part is spelled da, you know, the, the letters are there, and the second part is zone because fuck you, apparently we're gonna add an O and an E. But also three, due to yesterday's mistake, I would like to say, I uh, we're hiring for dude bros on the research writer team now. If you watching right now are a licensed dude bro, a dude, or even a brosif, maybe even a Chad or a Kyle, as long as you have your documentation, please submit your resume in those comments down below. But with that out of the way, buckle up, hit that like button, or one of my newly hired Kyles will punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. And the first things we're gonna talk about today is why we have two different kind of celebrity news. The first is a story that when I saw it, my first response was, what the fucking fuck? And it involves rapper T.I., and specifically something he, he talked about and admitted to on a podcast. On the podcast, he ends up talking about his 18-year-old daughter, Deja, right, saying that he's doing everything in his power to make sure she is still a virgin. This also includes yearly visits to the gynecologist together and Okay, let's go through this quote together. He said, quote, so we'll go and sit down and the doctor will come and talk and the doctor is maintaining a high level of professionalism. He's like, you know, sir, I have to in order to share information. I'm like, Deja, they want you to sign this so we can share information. Is there anything you wouldn't want me to know? See, doc, no problem. So just to stop there, already red flagged. And so he continues, and so then they come and say, well, I just want you to know that there are other ways besides sex that the hymen can be broken, like bike riding, athletics, horseback riding, and just other forms of athletic physical activity. So I say, look, doc, she don't ride no horses, she don't ride no bikes, she don't play no sports. Just check the hymen, please, and give me back my results expeditiously. Then, going on to share, I will say as of her 18th birthday, her hymen is still intact. And that, I guess, is the end of my brand new segment, that's the weirdest shit I heard today. Also, a side note, not to turn this into a sex ed video. Hymens can also break if, yes, someone has sex or, you know, there, there's rigorous physical activity like the ones mentioned, but also something as simple as using a tampon. Also, some people are born with hymens that are naturally open. And so with that said, I hope we learned something since that probably got this video demonetized. Or honestly, there's a few things we're gonna talk about today that might get the job done. But main point, any parents out there, please do not be like T.I. here. It is, it is creepy and overbearing and just uh, a lot of words that I'm just not gonna say right now. And any young women that are watching right now, if a parent is being like this, no, that is not okay or normal. This is the pressuring of a young person into sharing just really intimate and personal details about their life. You are a person and not just some thing that can be tainted and reflect poorly on your parents. So there was that. And then the other bit of celebrity news just a big pivot, uh, is connected to a death row inmate. So this is Rodney Reed. He's a 51-year-old man who's scheduled to be executed later this month for a crime that he says that he did not commit. And while the execution is very soon, Reed's actually been on death row for about two decades now for the murder of 19-year-old Stacey Stites. But now, a person by the name of Arthur Snow has come forward claiming that it was the victim's fiance, a former police officer who committed the crime, not Reed. Right, so to understand this, we need to look back to the actual crime. Back in 1996, Stites was found dead in a wooded area in Bastrop, Texas, after being a assaulted, raped, and strangled. Police initially questioned her then fiance, Jimmy Fennell, after suspecting that he may have been responsible for the crime. Fennell ended up failing two lie detector tests administered by the police, but the DNA on Stite's body didn't match his. And that's when the investigation shifted towards Rodney Reed, whose DNA was found to be a match. Now, Reed admitted to having a sexual relationship with Stites behind Fennell's back, but maintained his innocence in relation to her death. But Reed was eventually tried and sentenced to death after he was found guilty of murder. Right, so that gives you an understanding of the case. And then we fast forward to this year, specifically October 30th. That is when Reed's lawyer in the criminal justice reform nonprofit, The Innocence Project, filed an application for clemency with the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles following the sworn affidavit of Arthur Snow a day prior. With Snow, notably not just some random guy, with Snow saying that back in 2010, Fennell actually confessed to the murder when the two were serving time together in prison. Also, on the note of, well, why was Fennell in prison? He was actually there on a rape conviction after assaulting a woman while on duty in 2007. And as far as why he would tell someone he committed this crime, Snow says that Fennell was seeking protection from the Aryan Brotherhood and went to Snow, a Brotherhood member, for help. With 
Snow saying that he confessed to this crime as a way to build trust. With Snow writing in the affidavit, toward the end of the conversation, Jimmy said confidently, I had to kill my N-word loving fiance. With Snow saying that he decided to come forward when he realized that Reed was serving time for Stites' murder after reading an article about him. Also, it is important to know that Snow isn't the only person who's pointed the finger at Fennel. Aside from Snow's testimony, the Innocence Project lawyers say that others have come forward with similar stories around Fennel, and specifically his anger towards his fiance, who he suspected was having an affair with a black man. A former insurance sales representative said he heard Fennel say that he would kill Stites if he caught her messing around. Charles W. Fletcher, a former friend of the couple, saying that Fennel had complained that Stites was cheating on him. Also, Jim Clampett, a former sheriff's deputy, said that at Stites' funeral, Fennel looked at her body and said, quote, you got what you deserve. Also, as far as Reed, at the time of his trial, no witnesses could corroborate his affair with Stites, which would have explained the DNA's presence. But now, the victim's cousin and co-worker have both said that the two were involved, according to the Innocence Project. Also, one of Stites' co-workers, Alicia Slater, said that Stites told her that she was, quote, sleeping with a black man named Rodney and that she didn't know what her fiance would do if he found out. Stites' cousin, Heather Stobbs, has also said she now feels that Reed was wrongly convicted and possibly even framed, telling a Fox affiliate in Austin that she had no doubt in her mind that Fennel committed the murder. And you also have the Innocence Project claiming that there were forensic issues with the investigation regarding the timeline of events. They've also pointed to the fact that Reed was convicted by an all-white jury as an issue and have pushed for the murder weapon, which was Stites' belt, to be tested for DNA evidence. And as of right now, Reed's lawyer says that he's only asking for a commutation of a life sentence, not a pardon, because he wishes to have his conviction overturned in court and to be vindicated at a fair trial in which a jury of his peers considers all the evidence he now presents to this board. Meanwhile, Fennel's attorneys responded to Snow's claims by calling him a career criminal, also noting that after Fennel's release from prison, he converted to Christianity and has been helping people battling drug addiction, with his attorney, Robert Phillips, saying that the allegation that his client is the true killer is laughably untrue, saying the evidence against Reed is strong and pointed to testimony from other women who said that they had been victimized by him and other sexual assaults that were never tried in court. However, regarding that, Reed has repeatedly denied being involved in those other sexual assaults and his lawyers say that Phillips and the state are focusing on those incidents because there's no evidence actually supporting Rodney's guilt. And with this situation, we've seen the calls for this case to be relooked at picking up heavily over the past few weeks. There was a change.org petition that had nearly 300,000 signatures as of this morning asking for a new trial and a stop of his execution. On Saturday, nearly 100 supporters gathered outside the Capitol building in Austin, Texas to urge Governor Greg Abbott to grant Reed clemency. Also, before Snow came forward last week, you had Kim Kardashian West calling on people to put pressure on Abbott, writing, please, Governor Abbott, how can you execute a man when since his trial, substantial evidence that would exonerate Rodney Reed has come forward and even implicates the other person of interest. You also had TV host Dr. Phil, who's posted frequently about this case and covered it on his show, saying, I don't think it's a question of whether he's guilty or not. I think the question is whether he had a full trial with a full airing of all the evidence. I think the answer to that question, in my opinion, is not just no, but hell no. And over the weekend, we saw a number of celebrities jumping on this, like Rihanna and Meek Mill, tweeting out a link to a petition to free Reed, which currently has over 1.5 million signatures. Similar support was shared by Quest Love, Gigi Hadid, Janelle Monet, also T.I. I'm glad there's a better story of you in the news. But as far as if this will work, right, will Greg Abbott stop this? A number of people are saying that it's unlikely. Yes, the Texas governor has the power to stay the execution for 30 days and order the state's board of pardons and paroles to investigate the possibility of commuting his sentence. But people are rarely granted clemency in Texas if they've been convicted of a felony or a violent crime. And according to the Texas Tribune, the governor has stopped just one execution in nearly five years in office. But still, right now we have to wait and see. It could go the other way. We see a number of hopeful people. But as of recording this video, the offices for the governor and the Attorney General have not issued formal statements about this case. And ultimately, with this story, of course, I I'd love to know your thoughts on this. What do you think will happen? What do you think should happen? Why, why not? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to see in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by Keeps. And I always mention this because this was news to me. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? And so Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with their scientific and affordable approach. With Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get medication delivered to your home, no more waiting rooms, no more pharmacy checkout lines. And Keeps treatments are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And they say that prevention is key. You don't have to go broke to avoid being bald. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products out there. So some of you may have tried them before, but probably never at this price. And actually on that note, treatments start at just $10 a month. And for a limited time, you beautiful bastards can get your order for 50% off. And so if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Franco, or just click that link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. The first bit of awesome is just a quick update regarding Team Trees. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what the heck that is, you can go to teamtrees.org, but for everyone else, the awesome news is that as of recording this video, they have raised 13.2 million dollars. Thus, we're currently looking at over 13.2 million trees 
getting planted. It's very awesome. And I also just wanted to give it another little nudge. Uh, hopefully it does get to that 20 million goal. Then BBC Earth gave us what to do if you see a polar bear. How to Drink gave us the mega seed extract from Rick and Morty. We had Amelia Clark taking a lie detector test. We had Louis Tomlinson answering the web's most searched questions. We had the cinematographer for the Joker explaining the impact of color in film. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the massive news this week around Jeffrey Epstein and this seemingly bombshell video leak at ABC News. And looking online, it appears there's been a lot of confusion around this story, a lot of people wondering what happened, when, and why. So let's break it down, right? So the story involves a woman by the name of Virginia Roberts Jufre, who in 2015 filed a civil lawsuit against Epstein, claiming that he had held her as a teenage sex slave. Also claiming that among other people, Epstein trafficked her to Prince Andrew. And following that, both Prince Andrew and Buckingham Palace denied this claim, calling it false and without foundation. However, regarding that, we do want to point out that they did meet at some point. This photo is showing Prince Andrew and a 17-year-old Jufre side by side, the prince holding her waist. But the reason we're talking about Epstein, Prince Andrew, and Jufre is because yesterday we saw a pretty wild update to this whole situation. This when the right-wing activist group Project Veritas posted this video to Twitter. That video is showing ABC News anchor Amy Roback saying that she had sat down with Jufre back in 2015. Roback then seeming to blast the network for not covering the story. First of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, we were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate and Will say, oh, that we, that also is. quashed the story. She told me everything. She had pictures, she had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton, we had everything. I, I tried for three years to get it on to no avail and now it's all coming out and it's like these new rel revelations and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God, we, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. And as far as that video goes, it appears that it was filmed in August of this year. Notably, just two days after Jufre had talked about the existence of that interview. And in fact, in a different interview with NPR, Jufre said that at the time she had viewed that ABC interview as a potential game changer. Also saying in a statement, appearing on ABC with its wide viewership would have been the first time for me to speak out against the government for basically looking the other way and to describe the anger and betrayal victims felt. Right, but main point, this video yesterday, it goes out. It blows up all over the place. Millions and millions of views. What we end up seeing later that evening is both ABC and Roebuck issuing statements. One, confirming that the footage is real. Also, two, as far as why ABC said that they didn't air the interview in a statement, an ABC executive explained that decision, saying the network hadn't been able to corroborate the details of Jufre's claim, so the network chose not to air it. But also, notably here, the executive also said that ABC never stopped investigating Epstein. Also, Robach appeared to backtrack from the comments that she made in the leaked video, saying, I was caught in a private moment of frustration. I was upset that an important interview I had conducted with Virginia Roberts didn't air. She then goes on to also talk about the interview not meeting ABC's editorial standards and adding, my comments about Prince Andrew and her allegation that she had seen Bill Clinton on Epstein's private island were in reference to what Virginia Roberts said in that interview in 2015. I was referencing her allegations, not what ABC News had verified through our reporting. And she ended this statement by by saying, in the years since, no one ever told me or the team to stop reporting on Jeffrey Epstein and we have continued to aggressively pursue this important story. Right, and so with all of that here, it is important to look at ABC and ask, well, did you actually keep investigating Epstein or are you just saying that? Right, and so in part to answer that question, we look at what they've released publicly. And according to NPR, since 2015, ABC has reported around two dozen different stories relating to Epstein either online or over broadcast. With the most notable being back in July, Nightline actually aired an interview with two other alleged Epstein victims. However, here's where things get tricky. Right, because in that NPR interview, interview from August that we just talked about a minute ago. NPR reported that in 2015, one of Epstein's lawyers, Alan Dershowitz, heard about Jufre's interview with ABC. Dershowitz then reportedly called ABC and spoke with two producers and a lawyer, asking them to not go through with the interview. And Dershowitz later confirmed those events with NPR, saying that he didn't want to see Jufre's credibility, quote, enhanced by ABC. And a massive note here, Jufre has also alleged that Epstein trafficked her to Dershowitz, but he's also denied those claims. And on top of that, unlike ABC, you had Julie Brown of the Miami Herald saying that she found Jufre's claims against Epstein Epstein credible. And actually because of her reporting, Brown has been credited with helping to reopen and bring national attention to the Epstein case. With Brown also then going on to say that there were other pieces of evidence that supported Jeffrey's story. Right, but ultimately that is where we are with the story as of right now. With this story, I'd love to know your thoughts on the whole thing in general, right? The, the responses after the release of the video. Any and all thoughts in those comments down below. And then let's talk about the big election news last night. Now when I say election, a lot of you probably think of 2020, but actually last night there were a number of local races. And with this, I, I want to break down some of the key victories, what, what people 
people are saying it says, what it actually says, maybe some gray area in between. And let's start with Virginia, where we saw Democrats take control of both the state's House and Senate after they were both controlled by the Republicans, winning six seats in the House, giving them a 55 to 45 majority, and two seats in the Senate, giving them a slimmer 21 to 19 majority. And with the state's governor already being Democrat Ralph Northam, this means that for the first time in close to two decades, the party has control over this trifecta in the state's government. And so what that potentially means for the state is it puts a lot of new issues on the table that the state's GOP had been rejecting. One of those key issues there is gun control. This especially of note locally after shooting killed 12 people in Virginia Beach in May. Northam had announced plans for new gun control policies, but the state's Republican lawmakers didn't have any interest, so this opens that door again. Also, Democrats in Virginia have been pushing for a $15 minimum wage, which would be exceptionally notable in Virginia, where the federally mandated minimum is $7.25 an hour. And that's just kind of some of a laundry list of potential things, like the Equal Rights Act, health care, and redistricting. Also, another really interesting story out of Virginia was Julie Briskman's win. Briskman won a seat on the Ladoon County Board of Supervisors, beating the Republican incumbent with a lead of 52%, right? Which is a super local position, but the, the reason I mention it is just, it, it shows you how kind of crazy the world is, how one thing happens and you never know what will follow. Briskman was the former government contractor who went viral in 2017 because of this photo where she was flipping off Trump's motorcade. She ended up losing her job over this and it seemingly inspired her to get a new one. And then there was the race in Mississippi, which actually was a major win for Republicans. You had Republican Tate Reeves winning the governor race there, going against the state's Democratic Attorney General, Jim Hood. And while you can usually count on Mississippi to be a reliable red state, Hood was considered a more moderate candidate, and so the race was actually fairly close. There was also a lot of name familiarity, which plays an important role since he was the AG since 2004, winning four elections to do so. But that proved not to be enough, with Reeves winning 52.2% to 46.6%. And as far as what this means for Mississippi, a number of things, but also Medicaid was a huge discussion point in this campaign, with Reeves being a vocal opponent of Medicaid. So the program in Mississippi is now unlikely to expand. And then, and this is the one that most people have been talking about, the gubernatorial race in Kentucky. And here we saw the state's Democratic Attorney General, Andy Bashir challenging the incumbent Republican governor, Matt Bevin. It was expected to be a tight race with one mid-October poll showing the two neck and neck, each with 46% of the vote. Then about a week after, you had Bashir with the advantage of 52 to 55. Also looking around, around a week later, there was a poll that had Bashir with a slight lead. Also another poll at the end of October giving Bevin a five point lead. And in the lead up to this election, it it was interesting to see what the campaigns were doing. It looked very much like Bashir was trying to make this about local politics, what I can do for the state. Whereas we saw Bevin seemingly trying to nationalize this election by trying to position himself very close to Donald Trump, almost seemingly right, turning this election into a referendum on the impeachment, which on the note of President Trump, he's been very vocal about supporting Bevin. Uh, in fact, even holding a rally in Kentucky on Monday night, also seemingly joking about how things might go if Bevin loses. If you lose, it sends a really bad message, it just sends a bad, and they will build it up Here's the story. If you win, they're going to make it like ho-hum. And if you lose, they're going to say, Trump suffered the greatest defeat in the history of the world. This was the greatest. You can't let that happen to me. And then what we ended up seeing Tuesday night is that Bevin ended up losing out in an incredibly close race. 100% of precincts reporting Bashir was in the lead with 49.2% to Bevin's 48.8%, or with a vote count difference of just over 5,000 votes. In fact, the votes were so close last night that the Associated Press refused to call it. Also on this note, with all the precincts in, you had Bashir declaring victory for himself, but also Bevin not conceding. And this morning we saw Bashir hold a press conference saying, uh, Last night, the election ended. It ended, and it's time to move forward with a smooth transition that we are here to do so that we can do the people's business. And as far as Donald Trump's reaction to this news, he has largely been downplaying this loss and rather focusing on the other Republican victories in the state. And of Bevin saying that he picked up at least 15 points in last days, but perhaps not enough fake news will blame Trump. Which I will say really quick regarding the, the 15 point claim. This is unfortunately the issue with polls. A lot of people just look at the polls that they want to use. As Nate Silver, the editor in chief of 538 pointed out, there was a poll showing Bashir with a double digit lead among likely voters. Other polls didn't show that. And the poll wasn't from a particularly reputable firm but that's where the White House claim is presumably coming from. Some important things to consider here when you're, you're making claims of what this means for the 2020 election. Yes, Bevin closely tied himself to Donald Trump, but one, it was an off-year election. Two, the other Republicans in the state won by healthy margin. Three, Bevin was kind of a special kind of toxic. He was literally the worst approved of governor in the United States, according to a July report. And he picked fights and made claims that just burnt him. One super notable one is when he blamed protesting teachers for possible child sexual assault. You know, here's what's crazy to me. You know how many hundreds of thousands of children today were left home alone? 
I guarantee you somewhere in Kentucky today, a child was sexually assaulted that was left at home because there was nobody there to watch them. All right, so there was that. And then also four, the Democratic challenger also had some familiarity with the voters. His father, years ago, also served as governor. All right, so understand that this governor's race is a unique case. That said, it didn't stop people saying that another polarizing politician from Kentucky was gonna get the boot. And notably here, I'm talking about the Republican Senator from Kentucky and Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, who is up for re-election next year. And hey, there could be some connection here, but if you looked at this election and you're like, it's definitely happening with Mitch, uh, you might find yourself severely disappointed. It's a different situation, there's different candidates, it is a national election, which has different voter turnout. But also, I get all the, the speculation, people are trying to gain some insight as we go into 2020, which who the hell knows? And that is where I'm going to end today's show. And hey, if you like this video, which I'm expecting you did because you got to the end, be sure to hit that like button. Also, if you're new here, you want more of these dives into the news, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Definitely tap that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if you're not 100% filled in, you should definitely check out that brand new podcast I put out with Joey Graceffa. Or maybe you just missed yesterday's show, you want to catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch either of those. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.